the Slack channel have uh, posted that they are familiar and currently use or have used uh, waveform cross-correlation in their research. So um, I want to highlight some exciting applications of waveform cross-correlations towards the end of, end of this presentation so that uh, the students who are more familiar with the technique um, are more uh, uh, engaged with today's presentation. So um, I'll continue on. Uh, again, I'm Elizabeth Berg. Uh, from the University of Utah, and we're going over waveform cross-correlations today as part of Unit 4. So a quick overview of what we're going to review today. We're going to go over the basic theory of cross-correlation, um, and then the major applications. I'll just briefly touch on match filtering. This isn't my specialty, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, and then we'll jump into cross-correlating waveforms to obtain empirical greens functions. And we'll go over the theory, processing, and some example applications uh, from the TA array. And then we're going to discuss uh, just briefly a few packages in Python that are available to do cross-correlation that I would highly suggest that you check out. Um, and then we are also going to, again, talk about the uh, highlights of unique cross-correlation applications. And I've posted a uh, thread within the Unit 4 um, module on Slack. And so please respond to that thread if you know of other exciting um, research that's going on using waveform cross-correlation that you think is especially interesting. Um, or mention it in the chat uh, at, when we get to that point in the presentation. So the basic theory. Last week, uh, Professor Herman Prieto covered uh, convolution. And so we are now all familiar with convolution. So here's the time domain representation convolution and the frequency domain representation. This week we're going over cross-correlation, um, which can be thought of as a sliding dot product and is written here for the time domain. And you can see that it is extremely, extremely similar to convolution. Pretty much the, the main difference is we have a plus instead of a minus um, here. And then the frequency domain representation includes this complex conjugate um, term. So I also want to mention some basic theory that cross-correlation, unlike convolution, is not commutative. So what does this mean? So first, let's prove how it's not commutative. So if this is a representation, which we just covered, and then we have, uh, if we substitute sigma equal to t plus tau in, then we can obtain the results here. Um, and. Uh, uh, we get sigma minus t here, and then we can move these terms around, and we can see that that's not actually equal to uh, h of t uh, cross correlated with x of t. So we can think about this as if t, if we reverse it, then um, z of minus t is equal to uh, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of h of sigma multiplied by x of sigma plus t, um, which gives us h of t cross-correlated with x of t, which is the reversed, the time-flipped um, result of what we had up here. So we can also think about this. This is just from Wikipedia. So um, if you're confused about this, I would suggest uh, going reading in a little bit about it. But I just want to highlight this uh, nice example that convolution, uh, if you convolve f with g or g with f, you get the same result. However, if you cross-correlate g with f or f with g, you have a flip of this, this uh, uh, result here. Uh, and then I just want to jump into the basic theory of going to the frequency domain, just a quick review. Um, I believe that uh, Professor Herman Prieto covered this for convolution last week, so we're all probably familiar with how to do this now, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, we can go into the uh, frequency domain via the Fourier transform um, to go from z of t to z of f where f is frequency. Um, and then if we substitute sigma is equal to t plus tau, uh, we have t equal to sigma minus tau and dt plus sigma. Then we get this uh, fun form here, and we can move some terms around and things. And then we get our final result here for the frequency domain representation. Uh, and then a quick shout out. We have covered this in depth uh, the last two weeks from um, Dr. Emily Willen and from uh, 
from Preta last week. So autocorrelation and power spectral densities. So we've covered power spectral densities before. Here's just a quick reminder of what we're talking about in case you're a visual person. So this is a figure from um, Keith Coper's group. So Coper and Burlak in 2015. Uh, and this is just showing the power spectral density is related to the autocorrelation um, at uh, station X. Uh, and then just a quick overview of match filtering. So we can do cross correlation, which is basically a uh, moving sliding dot product here. So this is a really nice representation provided by Shimei Wu um, in uh, reference to her uh, recent work on Yellowstone and steamboat uh, geysers. And so we can see the delay time and the cross correlation amplitude. And when this waveform can be detected within this noisy signal, then we get a, a spike. Um, which many of you are familiar with based off of your SOC responses, which is great. Um, another shout out of other uh, applications of match filtering. So uh, there's waveform correlation event detection, which is basically what we just talked about. And this is from a paper from uh, Stephen Aerosmith, who will be presenting next week. So stay tuned for uh, his um, array processing uh, module. And then we also have subspace creation and detection um, to classify different uh, events together. And an example of that is shown here from uh, Chambers et al. in 2015. And there are many, many examples of using match filtering. So if you have a preferred favorite, feel free to post in the Slack um, channel. So uh, cross-correlation, we could also use this to obtain empirical greens functions. So typically we can use this to uh, obtain body waves. Marina Kata has several papers on this and surface waves, um, which Fanchi Lin and uh, a lot of people have papers using surface waves also. Um, and we can obtain this using uh, ambient noise cross correlation. Um, and there are lots of papers detailing how to go about processing to do this. We'll do some processing in our Jupyter notebooks today, um, but you can uh, review Lin et al 2014 and then Benson et al. 2007, and there are many others. Um, and then this is just for reference. We all know this, but it's nice to have a, a common figure um, of a Rayleigh wave and the direction of propagation in this retrograde particle motion, which uh, gives a very large signal. So it's a little bit easier to detect than that body wave. Um, so this is an example where we have two uh, detectors and uh, we have noisy waveforms at both. And if we have signal that's passing um, it goes through this detector and then travels through the subsurface and is recorded again at this detector. We can cross correlate these two noisy waveforms to obtain the empirical Green's function, which is sensitive to the subsurface structure between these two, two stations um, because it's changed as it goes from one station to the other station. Uh, and usually this is very, very small, um, but we uh, stack things up and then after stacking things up over enough time, then we can observe clear signal. So here is just an example of a synthetic. Um, so if we have noise sources everywhere and we get waveforms from those noise sources and we cross correlate them, then we can obtain a very beautiful uh, empirical Green's function, or excuse me, a very beautiful cross correlation, um, which is related to the empirical Green's function. And so this is really beautiful and really exciting. However, in the real earth, we typically don't have sources everywhere. Um, our sources are, uh, tend to be limited to ocean microseismics, which we've covered the last two weeks. Uh, but honestly, you can use any sort of source as long as it travels uh, and is recorded at one station travels through whatever subsurface space you're interested in and is recorded at the next station. If you have a source and it is uh, not um, creating a wave that's traveling between the two stations, then um, of course you, you won't be able to use this uh, to obtain uh, a Green's function. And then something to keep in mind that depending on the processing that you do, your cross correlation may or may not be directly related to the Green's function. And so there are lots of papers detailing about how specific processing is or isn't related to the Green's function and how to uh, resolve those sort of issues. And so 
um, depending on what sort of processing you use, it's just something to keep in mind. So this is just a quick uh, overview from uh, Pia Chi Lin et al. 2008, um, just reviewing how uh, they went from the cross-correlation function to the Green's function using um, the average of uh, the causal and acausal sides. So this is the acausal side for those of you who are familiar, which is the negative lag time. And this is the causal side, which is the positive lag time. And the positive lag time corresponds to, if this is a cross correlation between station one and station two, the causal side corresponds to station one as a source, virtual source, and station two as a virtual receiver, and vice versa for the uh, acausal side. So just a quick uh, review of some USRA um, applications and uh, of cross correlation. So this is a quick review from Pinchy Lin et al. 2008, where cross correlations were used to um, find Rayleigh waves, which have this lovely retrograde particle motion. And then this information was used to do iconal tomography to obtain phase velocity maps uh, and H over B uh, ratios. And the USRA was one of the initial large scale deployments that enabled the power of cross-correlation to image the subsurface of the Earth to really be uh, understood and be extremely useful. Um, and so I would highly suggest, if you are unfamiliar, to go check out the papers that have come out um, at that time. And recent publications of the Alaska Transportable Array have also uh, come out in the last year or two, so go check those out as well. So in general, the processing scheme and we will review this in the Jupyter Notebooks today, so we're just going to briefly gloss over this now, is you take raw data, remove the instrument response, remove the mean, remove the trend, band pass filter, and cut to whatever length you want. So in Benson et al. 2007, they used one day cross correlations. You can use shorter time windows, you can use longer time windows. It depends on uh, many things. Usually the main contributing factor is your computation uh, allowed time and storage space. So how many windows do you really have, uh, do you need um, to obtain a signal? So you generally try to cut down to whatever um, time frame that you need that is actually going to give you a good signal, but fully captures whatever source that you're looking for. So if you have an eight second uh, microsize moving through, you need to make sure that your uh, window is going to be able to be long enough to capture uh, that source reaching um, the very far and near stations throughout your array. So you want to just make sure that your windows are long enough to capture that. But usually that's not the problem. Usually the problem is computation time and storage space. After doing this, then uh, time domain normalization is applied. Uh, we'll review that today, but basically this is um, trying to take out earthquake signals and other uh, noise signals that you might not want um, by doing uh, a time domain um, normalization, uh, which is a running mean in the time domain. We'll review that in the Jupyter Notebook. And then you apply spectral whitening, which was, I believe, briefly reviewed a little bit last week or touched on. Um, and this is basically the same thing as time domain normalization, but in the frequency domain. You can tweak these however you like, and for those of you who have uh, a little bit more cross-correlation experience uh, in terms of retrieving the empirical Green's function, I encourage you to post in the Slack what you have found to be useful and what sort of data sets that you are using because how you need to do this depends a lot on um, the deployment that you're working with, the station instrumentation, um, a lot of different factors. And then the phase two, you compute your cross-correlations and then you stack your uh, cross correlations together to uh, obtain your final result. And we'll also overview the importance of stacking uh, today as well. So again, we'll play around with this in the notebooks today, but please add to the Slack whatever you have found useful in your own research. So this is a quick example from the transportable array in Alaska. This is band passed around 16 seconds. This is from source station DHY shown as a star here. This is just a record section um, sorted by distance of the station from DHY. And you can see this really beautiful, this is not symmetric, um, signal moving out corresponding to the surface waves. This is the ZZ component. Now I'm going to show a quick video that's going to capture how the Rayleigh waves really move. Um, and this has not been 
uh, tweak to highlight Rayleigh waves. It just happens that that's the dominant signal that we are seeing um, for the specific uh, station and then this specific period, which is a 16 second period. And um, here I'm using the ZZ, ZN, and ZE cross correlations to determine at each station um, what the color is. And then the size will also change according to if it's at the uh, positive or a negative side of the peaks here. So if it's at the positive, it'll be larger. And if it's negative, it'll be smaller. And then I also have it move according to the ZN and ZE um, distance. Uh, space and so you'll be able to see the retrograde particle motion here. So I'm going to hit play. So here you can really see that retrograde particle motion and I'll, I can post this in the Slack and it's also on my YouTube channel um, for those who are interested if the lag time is making it look a little funky here but it's really really cool to be able to see what just the relatively raw cross-correlated data can give us and the very beautiful Rayleigh waves that we're capturing from this. So this is that beautiful retrograde motion moving out. Um, and then this is a reference station, which is shown as this triangle here. And I'll show that one more time. Um, multiple desktop issues. <laughs> uh, you can see it retrograde as it moves in towards the source station, because we're on the eight causal side. That really highlights how that works. And then as we switch over to the causal side, and see that surface wave moving out. Yeah. Cool. So I also want to mention that there are some beautiful advantages, as you can see, <laughs> uh, to using a dense nodal array. So this is a very dense array in Long Beach. Uh, and Fanchi Lin in 2013, I think, published one of the initial papers showing cross-correlation um, application to this data set. And there have been a lot of papers since then that have worked on using machine learning with this, using uh, trying to retrieve body waves, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's just really beautiful um, just what the raw cross correlations can show you about uh, what the source distribution looks like, what the uh, wave pattern looks like, the different nuances to that pattern, et cetera. So now we're gonna jump into just a quick uh, shout out to some Python packages that are available uh, to do cross-correlation. So there's always OBSPY, you know, our, our good friend has a cross-correlation function and so you can check that out. Um, another uh, option is MS Noise, which is a Python package that's been around for a while. And a newer Python package that's come onto the scene recently is NoisePy. Um, each of these has its pros and cons, so I would highly suggest that you all go check them out if you're interested in using them and try to see what will work best for your specific application. Um, and then just a shout out that if you do use one of these packages, please include it as a reference and at least in the acknowledgement section of your paper. Um, I've included the citations here, but they're also always on the website of where you um, uh, for that specific package on GitHub or their personal websites. And it's very important because it helps these different groups be competitive for grants and funding, and then also um, for their different uh, students and colleagues within um, creating that package in being competitive for their own job applications and grants and things like that. So make sure that you do that. Plus, it's also good just to cite resources so other people know how they can try to uh, use the science that you find too. So now I'm gonna jump in to the fun part of the lecture, which is just a few application highlights. Um, again, if you know of any that really exciting studies, please post them in the Slack or in the chat here, and I'd be happy to give them a, a shout out, or, or Francisca or Suzanne can give them a shout out too. So uh, there's always our classic friend, tomography. So, uh, there's the transportable array, so I just included a little plug for my own paper here, um, uh, showing the uh, Shiri velocity model at one to 100 kilometer depth here. Um, you can see really beautiful uh, sedimentary basins and mountain ranges and um, underplated sediments uh, and specific slabs and all sorts of really cool things are available from tomography. This was using the transportable array, similar to the uh, lower 48 
um, of the United States to transportable array, the US array. Uh, and there's also uh, regional network studies doing tomography. So here's just a quick shout out, um, uh, tomography to Southern California. And there's uh, tomography from NOAA arrays. I've only thrown two on here because there are just so many I couldn't choose. So I chose two and then just moved on. <laughs> um, but so there's double beam forming from uh, uh, Yudong Long and uh, from Nori Nakata, there's this beautiful P wave velocity cube of Long Beach, California. Um, but there are lots of studies using nodes uh, to do tomography and via cross correlation. And so uh, go ahead and check out some of those papers and post them in the Slack. Um, just a quick shout out that uh, the recent Utah magnet earthquake sequence, there's a PhD candidate about to graduate, Glenn Pine. Um, who did double difference relocation using cross correlation differential times. And so you can see that just using differential times from the catalog uh, gives you kind of pretty uncertain results. And then using differential times from cross correlation really tightens up uh, results, uh, which is really important for us to be able to characterize the magnet earthquake sequence for Salt Lake City, Utah, and determine hazard analysis, risk analysis, um, imaging fault structure, et cetera. Uh, another shout out to uh, Jeff Moore's uh, research group, uh, also at University of Utah, but they have this really awesome paper um, come out this year, very, very recently from Paul Geimer, uh, looking at uh, vibration and modes from cross correlation of uh, stations, nodal instruments that are deployed over uh, an arch and trying to image the different resonance modes and um, things like that, which is really cool. So go check out that paper. Uh, and then this is just another example of match filtering. Uh, I wanna highlight some recent work using um, cross correlation that's uh, been used to image Old Faithful uh, Geyser's plumbing structure, including this upper part from um, Tsinghua uh, out of Taiwan now, and then uh, this lower part from Chimei Wu and others. Uh, in 2019, and they were able to use cross correlation to really carefully image this detailed structure here um, based off of uh, imaging the doing cross correlation to locate the uh, source um, of the bubble collapse and, and other things. So go check out this paper. It's really cool. And this is just a quick video showing how the tremor shifts throughout the eruption cycle using cross correlation to detect and uh, locate that tremor source. Uh, and then just another uh, example, which is really cool, using um, uh, cross correlations to uh, estimate magma pressurization uh, within the, uh, uh, the dike um, at the Kilauea, Kilauea 2018 volcano eruption in Hawaii and uh, estimating debut of the And then um, this is just another example of using waveform correlation to get more accurate differential times for Tomo DD uh, from um, it scales uh, bolt now uh, in 2018. And so this is a figure from that paper, just an example of uh, another study using um, sort of the match filtering and uh, waveform correlation to technique to get differential times. And then here's just one example. There are a lot of examples of this, but the building damage detection, this is from Kohler et al. 2018, um, which is using cross correlation to estimate where there is uh, damage within a building. Uh, so go check out that study as well. And here, just a, some of the references that I mentioned before. Um, and thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions or um, comments or shout outs of certain studies or anything else. Then here's just a plug for me. I wanted a clear cut, so if Francisco wants to include this, that's cool, but you don't have to. <laughs> um, I have a, a website that you can check out, and then this is my contact information for folks um, here. Uh, and I noticed in the chat there's a request to share the slides. Um, I'll share the slides that I have 